Welcome. Uh, thank you for attending uh, the OJM Group's uh, podcast on physician hospital integration. We're going to discuss the financial pros and cons. My name is Jason Odell, one of the partners at OJM Group. Uh, we're going to uh, spend a short amount of time today covering uh, this topic, which I think is a hot new topic due to the fact that a lot of our clients throughout the country are either being approached by hospitals or have been approached by hospitals to integrate their practice with the hospital, having the hospital purchase them, or are currently or have been purchased by the hospital. And so today's uh, podcast is going to be used to really cover what are the financial aspects behind doing this and does it make sense to, um, from a financial perspective, to do a hospital integration. I think that there's a lot of pros and cons that come out of, of hospital integration and, and what you'll what we will talk about and as we get through the disclaimers here um, and, and into our agenda is, is, is really a lot of different different things that you need to look at when discussing uh, hospital integration so what we're going to provide to anybody that's listening to this podcast is any of our materials uh, that you'll see up on your screen now uh, we've written a number of books specifically for uh, physicians. Uh, we'll be happy to provide those materials uh, to you. If you're not a physician, we've written a number of books uh, that are specific to uh, non-physicians as well. And uh, we'll be happy to provide any uh, copy of any of the book, uh, even downloaded in an e-book, um, or excuse me, an iBook or a uh, Kindle format as well. So today's webinar. We'll cover uh, 10 topics. Uh, we'll move pretty quickly as we want to take uh, not too much of your time. We want to do this quickly and, and uh, bring this up to you in a, in a rapid manner so that it at least educates you on the different areas financially when you're looking at hospital integration. And that way, if you have additional questions, you can certainly feel free to look, contact us and we'll have that information uh, for you at the end. So today's webinar, why uh, would you sell your medical practice? Uh, what are the important things to look at? What financial structure are they potentially offering the hospital to you? What are the benefits that you have versus what are the hospital benefits? We'll look at scheduling and vacation time and all that good uh, stuff. Current staff and what does their job security look like moving forward? What happens to the various assets that your medical practice has? Let's talk about medical malpractice. We'll cover a couple case studies additional options and then we will summarize. So why sell your medical practice? Well, there's a number of reasons. We really break them down into three categories. One is there's a financial reason to sell. You're, there's a management reason to sell. You want to get rid of the management responsibility that you currently have. It's bogging you down and you want to focus on what you've trained your entire life to do and that is to do patient care and therefore the management piece is something you don't have an interest in. Or there's that strength in numbers, that gravitation towards working uh, with a larger group with common interests so that you have leverage with medical uh, management contracts that are coming back to you uh, with, with negotiating uh, with various vendors and suppliers. Uh, that strength in numbers tends to help uh, significantly. So there, there you can see that you've got a couple different reasons why you'd potentially look at selling your medical practice, and we'll dig into each one of these. So let's talk about financial reasons, right? So from a financial perspective, you have the opportunity to reduce overhead expenses. You know, you can have, uh, if a hospital integrates you, you can have the hospital um, take over all of your overhead. You'll be paid a salary maybe based on in, in, in some type of productivity-based formula. Uh, you can increase your financial security of the practice. Now the practice has the hospital backing you up. Um, and you can lock into some guaranteed income for a set number of years. So financial reasons tend to be the number one reason when you're, when you're considering moving into hospital integration. That tends to be the number one concern that, that comes out. That's, financial certainly is not the only reason. Uh, to consider making the transition, but it, it certainly is normally the number one or number two reasons. Management reasons, we, we, we touched on 
for just a second, but you know, dealing with employees is gone. You know, you don't have to worry about the electronic medical records implementation. Let the hospital deal with all of that. Let's make sure that they're compliant and they move over. You know, not dealing with compliance and billing and office locations and, and hiring and firing of staff and HR uh, issues all go somewhat away if, if the hospital takes over in the integration. With that being said, all that control of those decisions and issues are removed from you as well. So for the physician that has more of an entrepreneurial spirit or, or uh, something of that nature, they may uh, find this to be more uh, distracting from a management, losing some of those management responsibilities than, than actually providing themselves a benefit by moving over. You know, strengths and numbers, you get financial support of a hospital traditionally has deeper pockets than a, than a medical practice. Leverage with the insurance carriers, Negotiating of contract with various contracts with various vendors are certainly um, important too when you're looking at this. Let's talk just about a financial structure of an offer and what does that financial structure potentially look like. You've got the lump sum payout and you've got an income and we'll talk get into some more of the types and guarantees and RVU base, but Let's look at the lump sum payout. Lump sum payout, the hospital provides a lump sum up front based on the valuation of your practice. So looking at a valuation of a practice, they'll give you a lump sum dollar amount to buy out your medical practice, either through a management agreement that they're now going to manage the practice, they're paying you for the rights to manage your practice, um, or through assuming your practice and, and giving you a lump sum. Key here is going to be how is that lump sum going to be taxed to you? Is that a long-term capital gains taxable event to you, or are they going to tax that to you as or are you going to be paying ordinary income tax? This is something you need to consult with your CPA about prior to making any decisions or signing any documents. This is an important thing because the significant there's a significant difference between the tax rates on long-term capital gains and ordinary income. Hospital would then assume any outstanding debt. Lump sum money is split equally between the partners, if it's a partnership, or based on the ownership percentages that are in a formula. You then take a look at income. So you've got the type of income will be, uh, as a hospital employee, is going to be a W-2 wages to you. So there's no income that's going to be paid to you in the form of W-2 wages and if you were a prior to hospital integration where an S corporation has distributions. So you lose the tax favorable treatment that S distributions have, the reduction of tax, and, and all your income now is being taxed at W-2 wages. So all includable, all taxed, uh, depending on where your income is, uh, all of that uh, is going to potentially, some of that will hit the highest marginal rates uh, that are out there. However, you do pick up guarantees traditionally with, with hospital integration. So you'd have a guaranteed income. It lasts for a period of time. Uh, one, having a guaranteed income in these times with Obamacare and, and where Medicare, Medicaid reimbursements are going with managed co care contracts and where they're going tends to provide some safety. If you can lock into a five-year guarantee, that tends to, to be something that is advantageous uh, for some of our physician clients. They look at that and say, okay, I've got five years. I'm locked in feeling confident because I am locked in for five years uh, of, of pay. I want to retire at the end of the fifth year. This allows me to sunset into uh, retirement. There's also bonuses based on RVUs, or there's structure where they would pay you based on your RVUs with a guaranteed minimum amount that you're, you're going to hit. So we see a combination of these, one type of these only, when hospitals are looking to integrate. Not that any one in particular is more advantageous than the other. You really have to go through and look at the economics uh, behind doing each of them. Let's talk a little bit, though, about current benefits versus hospital benefits. You know, current benefits allow for uh, traditionally medical practices to have qualified retirement plans, non-qualified retirement plans, health insurance, um, and 
expense reimbursement for marketing and travel and those sorts of things. So if we dug into the first one, which is retirement plan, and we look at that benefit that you currently have, is the hospital going to provide you the same benefit that you currently are having? Or will they limit the amount that you can contribute and to your qualified retirement plan? Will the hospital have a different plan structure? It doesn't get you as much money to be able to put away as your old plan was. Because remember, now you're losing control of making those decisions. The hospital will now make them for you. And if they are, if they do have a plan that's different than your current plan, how are you going to make up the difference of what your current plan was allowing you to put away and what the new plan is now allowing you to put away? A lot of clients have created non-qualified plans in their practice to make up the difference. And what if the hospital does not provide a non-qualified plan? Or maybe, what if the hospital does have a non-qualified plan or a deferred compensation plan, and currently you don't have it, so there is an ad it, it, to the advantage of the, of the hospital integration because you pick up a better benefit plan using a deferred compensation plan. Traditionally, that's going to depend upon what kind of hospital is purchasing you, whether it's a private hospital or a nonprofit hospital. If not, when you try to make up that excess savings, what are the tax disadvantages or advantages to you? If no longer, if you no longer have a non-qualified plan, or you no longer have as good of a qualified retirement plan, so we'll cover a little bit more and dig into that topic a little bit later in, in this as well, because I want to I want to drill down on a case study in there. Health insurance. You know what coverage um, or cost do you have to you, the physician, and to the employees based on what you used to be providing or 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 paying for your health insurance? Normally, with the health insurance, the physicians will pick up better coverage if you get into a bigger group, better pay uh, in terms of cost to you. Uh, and the reason being is that you've now got a, a larger number of insureds in the plan, and therefore the experience becomes better, and the annual increases to the health insurance costs are are going down uh, because they're they're not distributed over a smaller pool, like in a smaller medical practice. So traditionally, we see health insurance as, as better with hospital integration than, on, than when physicians are out on their own. But what about things like expense reimbursement? So with expense reimbursement, you've got continuing medical education, the travel, marketing, additional expense the physicians want to run through the practice. Uh, once you've integrated with a hospital, none of those are, are necessarily covered. Uh, the additional expenses that you would run through the practice. But uh, traditionally, they'll put a, a, a sum or a dollar amount for continuing medical education. They're now assuming all of the marketing that you're going to practice is going to do, so they're going to do the marketing for you. So it's not as if you're going to have the opportunity to tell them, I want to do this marketing or that marketing. Certainly, you can provide input, but their marketing budgets are set. They're doing them traditionally prior year uh, in advance. And and you're very much limited to what's going to be out there for you to do from a marketing perspective. The other thing is, what about all the, what I call the four main important things to everyday living and everyday life for physicians? That is your scheduling, the patient hours, call time and vacation time. Before, when you were a physician uh, that owned your own practice or was an owner of a practice, you had control of all of these things. You could set your hours, your time for seeing patients. Your call time was just traditionally distributed amongst your partners and, and any other groups you would have been associated with. And your vacation time was based on what you guys all thought was fair as a, as a group. Now when you move into the hospital, practice in the hospital is making the rules. They're going to set your schedule and patient hours. They're going to tell you when you're on call and when you're not on call, and they're going to tell you what vacation you have and how much of it that you have. So negotiating these things in the initial part of the discussion becomes very crucial because what you don't want to have happen is all of a sudden now you've picked up an extra eight or ten hours a week um, of work, and that that's a big a big issue. The other big thing that a lot of our physician clients have is their current staff. 
and wondering what's going to happen to them and their job security. You know, a lot of our physicians will have had staff that have been with them for a long period of time. And they want, you want to discuss this in advance. You want to discuss this prior to signing any agreement. What's going to happen with my current team? My current staff that's been loyal to me for a long period of time that I rely on to get things done, that know me, know how to work with me. What's going to happen? Well, a lot of times the hospital will come in and change office managers. They'll tell you these are the nurses. They'll downsize. They'll... Um, bring in new, new um, staff to work with you, and uh, they'll say, hey, we're going to add a couple new positions to your practice as well, because um, we've combined these practices, so now you're working alongside a couple new physicians, and you know, all those dynamics have a uh, major impact on, on your life, your lifestyle, um, your uh, enjoyment of working or not, so those are the, the things that you need to be concerned about when you're looking at hospital integration. And those are things that need to be talked about prior to hospital integration. The other thing is what happens to all of your assets, uh, the practice's assets? So what if you had a surgery center? What are what do the accounts receivables go? What about uh, office building that you own? Uh, what's going to happen uh, to that? Where is the equipment um, that the hospital already provides? You know, normally we see you have some overlapping equipment that's accounted for in the valuation when they buy out your practice with that lump sum amount. But you never know uh, what's going to happen uh, when they come in to do the valuations. Your account receivables tend to end up in that valuation. But let's say you own a building. Will the hospital buy your building from you? Again, it could be a great exit strategy out of a piece of real estate that's your medical practice prior to your retirement. You know, with the surgery center, you know, what are you going to do with the surgery center? And if you're an employee, how would your ownership be maintained in the surgery center if now all of your surgeries are being performed at the hospital if you're in that uh, type of an arrangement. So those are things you need to consider and how they get valued into the overall aspect of the integration. The other thing is look at the medical malpractice insurance. If you have an occurrence policy right now that you currently have, you're good. Normally when you go to the hospital, the hospital will pick up medical practice insurance for you, but if you had claims made coverage and you're, in, and you're moving to the hospital and there's going to be a tail coverage, who's going to cover the cost? You know, with the hospital having deep pockets, you know, you'll be on their health insurance, so that's an advantage for you traditionally. Um, you know, the legal exposure for physicians because you're an employee um, now is 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 actually reduced. So you you know you see. Most hospital physicians, employed physicians, less liability, or excuse me, less legal action um, and less medical malpractice cases. Again, some hospitals are more difficult to fight with. But it, again, it removes that from you as the physician to having to deal with it. Certainly, there's still the aspect of, of a medical malpractice lawsuit, but the hospital now is going to have to deal with it. And so, again, it removes some of that, as, some of that aspect out of your area and into the area of the hospital. So, you know, overall, you, you look at this hospital integration and all these different areas that you need to be concerned with, and you, and, you, and you look at, you know, financial reasons, management reasons, strength and numbers, and, you know, we've talked about some of the pros and cons and losing some of the benefits that you would have, whether it's a retirement plan or non-qualified retirement plan, your health insurance and expenses. The, the other things like scheduling and patient hours and call time are also, uh, vacation time are also important aspects. And I, I, what I would say is the, those are all very important things that can be discussed well in advance. And you just got to think through, you know, when a hospital is looking at purchasing, you got to think through all of these issues that are could be possibilities that come up and just negotiate through those um, prior to signing anything or making any election. And it's a longer process, and it's not something that should be entered into lightly. So what, what I wanted to break out now was a case study uh, that we've done on a private practice scenario and looking at the different case study economics behind it. So here we've got a 45-year-old with a very uh, orthopedic surgeon with a very successful practice. It's, it's growing. It's currently acts as an S corporation. And they had practice revenue of 1.8 million uh, collected 
and they had a practice expense of a million dollars. And that included contributions into a defined benefit plan, a defined contribution plan, they were leasing cars and other business related expenses that were about $10,000 annually, and they had personal income disposition of 800,000 total from their medical practice. 400 was paid to them in W-2 wages, 400 was paid out to them in, in the form of an S distribution. So let's take a look at what this means in terms of the tax savings. So if you, if you look at tax savings on the total amount that's contributed uh, on the behalf of this doctor in private practice from their defined benefit plan and their defined contribution, the deduction of expenses and the S distributions, they have a savings in taxes at a approximate 40% federal income tax savings rate of $53,000 in an annual basis. So you can see in the private practice setting that the tax savings is pretty significant. Now, let's take that same orthopedic surgeon who becomes a hospital employee and makes the same exact amount of income. They have 45 years of age, they're going to make $800,000 of income, but it's now going to all be W-2 taxed income. So they only a hospital now only has a 403B retirement plan. So they're going to you're going to participate in the maximum allowable 16,500 in the past in 2013 that amount has actually gone up to $17,500 that you can contribute, but you'll see the economics here anyway that shows that the hospital uh, by becoming a hospital employee, here is your savings on that amount. You're going to save the tax on the amount you can defer of $16,500. You get to save on the FICA Medicare tax because the hospital now covers half of Social Security tax. So you're now tax savings on your $800,000 that you're getting as a W-2 employee that is different than what it would have been as, the, as a physician in your own practice is now $13,222. So if you look at the difference, there's about a $39,000 difference between what you were saving in private practice and what you're now getting to save in taxes as a hospital employee. You know, and that's that struggle um, over money. Uh, and what is the, you know, how do you get, how do you take advantage of the most dollars that you can get in your pocket with tax rates, rates ever? rising right now and where our economy is headed at this point in time and the fact that we've got sequester going on, we've got the Congress trying to figure out a way to balance the budget and come to some agreement on it, you know, who knows what, what's going to happen with, with the struggle. So one of the things that, that we, we talk to our clients about is what can you do in a practice if you currently own it and you say, I want to stay there, but I also want to say, I don't want to do hospital integration, I want to save more taxes, though. Look at the various hybrid plan, plans that are out there. Or the other thing you do is take it to the hospital when it's part of the negotiating and say, I want a hybrid benefit plan that can, that can be in addition to what the hospital is currently providing in my 401k or profit sharing or pension plan. You know, those are things that are, are important to look at and to talk about, again, in addition uh, to what the hospital is currently providing, ask them to add some of these when you're negotiating with them. Say, I'd like to put some type of a hybrid qualified plan in place, which doesn't affect the hospital in a negative way, but allows me to put more money away in a tax advantageous way. That's important when you're when you're talking about hospital integration. The other thing, you know, is do you just stay in your practice? If you decide, hey, listen, hospital integration is not the right avenue for me, have you looked at how your practice is structured currently? What is the legal entity structure? How is it taxed? Become more efficient in how you're doing those things to maximize your ability to save on taxes. Better corporate structure means lower taxes. Adopt cost-cutting measures with vendors. You know, look at um, benefit plans that are advantageous for the owners of the company. Um, see if you can avoid being acquired um, by becoming more financially efficient. I mean, those are important things. Are there uh, ways that the practice can be financially uh, more efficient and therefore saving dollars? 
those are you know concerns that, that, that you should address. Risk. You know, in summary, you know, risk, we've got changes in healthcare which are causing physicians to trade risk and re, re, the risks and rewards of private practice for the safety of a hospital or salaried employment. And I understand that those risks are out there and you should definitely explore those risks, you should look at things from an economic perspective, not just how are you going to be able to practice medicine in the future, but financially uh, and benefit-wise, how would a hospital integration impact you? Next steps, we're certainly happy to uh, provide a free copy of our books to you if you'd like to see them. There's an available a download edition of a highlights version of For Doctors Only. We'd be happy to schedule a complimentary initial consultation with you. Uh, that initial consultation uh, will allow us to learn more about your particular situation, explain better about how OJM can help you as a physician um, in various areas. You can schedule uh, or subscribe to our free online uh, e-newsletter that comes out uh, every month. And you can contact us at the number listed on your screen or Certainly, I'm willing to have email sent to me at odell at ojmgroup.com. I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you would have based on this podcast that we're providing. Hopefully, you found it valuable and we're able to, to uh, gain a few points if this is something that is you're considering right now. wanted to, to make it short and sweet. Hopefully, we've accomplished that by uh, an under 30 minutes uh, uh, in terms of talking. Uh, look forward to speaking to any of you that have any questions. Appreciate you spending the time on the phone with me uh, or the podcast listening to uh, us today.